start it off. Here we go. Welcome back, everyone, to the Natty 19 Behind the Screen bonus episode 11. It's been quite a while since uh, you've heard a bonus episode from us, with good reason. Uh, things have been moving along. We've been up to no good, for sure. I'm joined here tonight, my lovely wife, uh, <laughs> Christy Lee, <laughs> plays the role of Air May. You all know her by now. And once again, Charlie, playing the role of the young Quincy Fallow. Quincy Fallow. Quincy Fallow. Quincy Fallow. Quincy Fallow. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? What are we uh, We're just doing here? Quincy Fallow over and over again. It's, our, <laughs> it's <laughs> late night. That's what we do. <laughs> uh, a lot's happened. Oh, that's normal. Sorry. T what, 20 or so episodes since our last BTS? A lot has happened. Uh, let's just give a quick rundown uh, of... Some big events. I think we're going to jump into some details starting since since we entered the city of Omu, or at least the yeah, outskirts. Yeah, that's where the real action began. Mm -hmm. Sure. But but just to give a quick rundown, just to get our minds set with it, we you guys had left uh, Nyanzaru. <laughs> You've gone down the Sash and Star River, past Camp Righteous, uh, to Camp Vengeance, where you stayed the night. Quincy had spoken with uh, a gentleman, a survivor, of the of the uh, Camp Righteous massacre, which was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a cool way to tie the kind of the both both timelines and. Yeah, 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 we came back full circle on that one, uh, and from there you travel to the Aldani Basin. You had a neat with you. That was your goal at that point. You were jumped by that Earth Elemental. You came across the Flaming Fist Mer the Patrol out there. That was pretty cool. I uh, thought that was going to go different. Yep. Because we had Copernicus there, and we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. But it was it was smooth. It was smooth, though. Yeah, you, well, you guys had your papers. Yep, we had papers. You had your papers. They didn't know anything about Copernicus, and nope. that was because, you know, we killed... <laughs> we killed maybe the only person that might have blown his cover. Mm. Yeah. And then off to the heart of Uptau, uh, where you met Valindra. Did you guys... Any of you guys... you. I'm not sure uh, how much of the D&D &D lore you guys know. Valinja's kind of a big name. Any of you guys uh, familiar with her? No. I, I have seen um, images of Valindra, I think probably in the future. Hmm. Um, I at least assume so because this woman was not anything you would go near. Um, <laughs> she was pretty terrifying looking and uh, we didn't seem to be that terrified of her maybe mistrust maybe we didn't trust her but she's quite ghastly in the images i've seen of her yeah she's kind of a big wig in the D, D universe um i thought immediately i i, I know zaveril no is familiar with her uh uh kway i should say not zaveril uh kway is familiar uh him and i play a lot of video games dungeon dragons video games as well never winter we mess around on and valindra right right from the beginning valindra is right in there um, I was a little worried that because of her uh, renown um, that there would be some conflict in there. Zaveril, for the most part, did pretty good at, at uh, ignoring it. He, he kept the metagaming to, to a minimum. But even if you did, even if you were familiar, because she is known as a villain... I think the Tomb of Annihilation campaign as a whole, and the, the, um, the reason I'm going into this is because up until the Omu story begins, I think this encounter is really the only big thing that I could think of to really dive into uh, before we get started in, into that, um, is I think this, this Tomb of Annihilation campaign, or, or any story where you introduce like a really dark, sinister evil, it leaves room for other villains uh to appear and become allies almost because this the the main villain is actually worse than them it, you know yeah and it's not as if like every evil character is all on the same team like evil is one team right they have their own sure. ends and they have their own objectives exactly so, yeah yep. makes sense 
Yep. So where I think in under normal circumstances, Valindra probably would have destroyed you guys or you guys would have been a lot more hesitant uh, had, she, had she been in her, her true um, light, if you mm. will. But uh, under these circumstances where you have this death curse and, and whatever's behind it, I think it leaves room for strange bedfellows as yeah. well. Holy shit sticks. What? <laughs> Was that the mirror? You're freaking out about everything tonight. <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean in the mirror now? And the mirror. I don't remember the mirror. Valindra had, had a mirror. If hair. we were to like glance into Valindra's mirror, would it have been like the red priestess from Game of Thrones and she would have been like <laughs> fucking... I thought you were talking about the mirror in the room because earlier you were freaking out about keys jingling or something. Oh, well, <laughs> No, yeah. no, there was the, the mirror in the scene of Valindra uh, where she was, okay, uh, okay. I she was fixing you. her hair. Oh, um, but yeah, It there caught was a... my eye. Like when you said it, I was like, I wonder what's up with she, what she got a mirror for out here in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> So you said bedfellows. I was thinking like maybe we'd be more like pawns to her, kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. Just something. Depending on perspective. Tools for her to use. Right, depending on perspective. I, right. I think it's in everybody's best interest. I think the nature of the beast is, in this case anyways, it's in everybody's best interest to end this death curse for one reason or another. Um, you guys have your reasons. She has hers. And I think that's you know what it boils down to uh so yeah going forward from there well hold up uh the heart of uptau uh this was uh, quincy had the map that was given to him by master tris yes and when he brought the map to anit's grandfather the heart of uptau was mentioned in his sort of reading was and, it was it the heart of uptau or was it a black obelisk uh, draped in vines Oh, I thought it was it the was, heart of Uptow. It's pretty Uptow. obviously a black obelisk. <laughs> <laughs> I better go back and listen. According thought, to the DM. <laughs> yeah. um, I thought it was the heart of Uptow. I better go back and give it a listen. Um, it ended with a black obelisk draped in vine, vines. Uh, he okay. may have, if the heart of Uptow was mentioned, it was definitely before that point. I wanted okay, to make I might sure have that latched it, on to like one detail and then right, mm, right. didn't um, register I, I believe anyway, uh, when... He was experiencing this vision. It was he was almost like traveling through Quincy's future, or at least a future that could pertain to Quincy, because you could right. have always died too. Right, you know? right. Um, and it ended at the Black Obelisk, draped in vines, where he couldn't go any further. He he kind of got cold feet, or he got something spooked him. Okay, essentially, yeah. So, and I don't think you guys have happened upon that yet. No, we have not. No. Um, but yes, you learn from Valindra your uh, your purpose. Now, she gives you information that was that had allowed you guys to hone right in on your objective, and she even gives you access to her magic circle, which which takes you to the outskirts of uh, the forbidden city of Omu. Now, is this, this is my impression is this is where a lot of people just jump right into for this, this campaign, this adventure. In the adventure book to Annihilation, this is pretty much where the um, adventure begins in terms okay. of, in terms of, how it's laid out up to this point it's very sandboxy they kind of give you a map so uh, of locations and some brief descriptions of those locations almost uh, like the old campaign settings yeah yeah and they and it's up to the dm to kind of forge a path and and kind of and up to the players as well yep. um as you go so yeah, from here a lot. This is this is where a lot of games that I've seen anyway pick up. Yeah, so we episode thirty six is when we enter Omu, and where we meet some new people, um, and where the adventure really starts to pick up. Who do we meet? Who's new? Well, thir- thirty six. Um, apart from there's actually from when we lasted a BTS until now, there's been. A, a lot of characters. So we had Valindra, obviously. We just spoke yep. on her. And now, upon entering Omu, we meet a couple new people. We meet Akramas and we meet Riga. Are you talking about Akramas, the fairy dragon? No. Upon entry? Because that's what the fairy dragon had introduced himself uh, as this time uh, around. Remember? Yes. 
Um, so we we meet the Fey Dragon, who I did, who is not who I met because we have met him before. Um, but upon entering Omu, we meet Akramas and Riga. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of interesting when we go into the city because like we're at it's this overtaken city we know nothing about. There's like all the dangers that one would expect in these jungles are out there Mm -hmm. and then we there's definitely like almost like um when you think of everest or some other like common expedition place there's there's like like a tourist place yeah and stuff like that you know it's it's interesting that It, it is because the first thing we come upon actually before riga and akramas is that scene the uanti scene the massacre of the red wizards so we oh, immediately yeah. see evidence of two larger uh, kind of factions vying for solving this death curse or for the soulmonger, whatever their purpose is, right away. And at the site of the massacre was the wild dogs, which I thought was kind of interesting because I... Because nothing really came of it. Yeah, no, nothing... Yep. You know, there was just wild dogs, and we scared one off, and that was it. There was no, were we didn't have to like fight eating, wild dogs. Were they just like we eating the carcass? Yeah, eating the carcass. Yeah, yeah. they're just eating carry on essentially. But it was it was interesting because I thought for sure we were going to fight them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But turns we're out, too high level to fight. Yeah, dogs. yeah but it that's, turns out they were just hanging that's, out. That's precisely what it is. Um, they are an encounter, and if it, it is written, if you get too close, uh, you may provoke them to attack. But what was there, five or six of them? Each one was like a half a CR. Um, yeah. For the You guys were all level five. For the purpose of the show and, you know, just for the sake of things, uh, I just instead turned it into a uh, intimidation check to scare him off. And maybe if he had rolled a one on the intimidation check, then I'd have them attack and we'll play it out. But... I just didn't see a need to to go through. A, a Probably wouldn't have been a very fight. tense battle or anything. Yeah, like yeah. No, I mean, but you guys good. had it's already taken much harder enemies. It's that better than not introducing an element that's there. You know, you could exactly. have simply left them out because, eh, why do it? But it's good to still have those elements around. It's like when you're you know playing a video game and you stop fucking with stuff that's absolutely yep. you know not oh, yeah, gonna yeah. Yeah. get I, I, you the anywhere the dogs were anymore. a great touch anyway when I read about them when I, I liked them being there it made sense to me that these bodies were it gave this city a, a certain uh, level of detail that may be swept under the rug if not careful that these corpses that you leave behind in your wake yeah they don't just stay there. The 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 jungle claims them, mm. you know. Right, right. Not only that, but those dogs probably always know there's meat in Omu. You <laughs> yeah, know what I yeah, mean? They're like yeah. strays. Yeah. yeah, they're like they know there's always yeah. going to be something to eat there because. Yeah, I will touch on. You guys had mentioned all the characters and the base camp and stuff like that, and that's pretty much exactly what the vibe of Omu is. It's a destination that is sought. There's, yeah, there's more than one expedition. There are other yeah, expeditions there. There's it's it's sought after for its difficulty. You had uh, we went into a little bit of detail about that small uh, group of tabaxi that hunt there. Tabaxi are cool. That's why they are very Just cool. Yeah, um, cool cats. <laughs> so not only do you have that the the people the the thrill seekers, but you also have the treasure hunters, um, the the lore seekers because there's so much ancient history there you've got the scholars that are after the these ancient texts and such and then you've got your treasure hunters that have been told of all the treasure buried beneath this ancient city um so it it is a a a a sought after destination and that's the way i read it as so that's the way i put it out there what we need is for the three c's to have exclusive rights (laughs) <laughs> over the Almost. lost city of Omu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am going to throw in at some point uh, a little traveling vendor um, that I think I, I, I touched on it before. Yeah. I, I think I referenced it as being one of the, the guys in Dark Souls, the little turtle yeah, the, guys, yeah. <laughs> the yeah, pilgrim yeah. guys with the shells on their back. Maybe they're just carrying a bunch of goods and they're hanging out on the outskirts of Omu. Um you know, selling potions and shit to people because you guys need to have a 
uh, we need to get some potions. You need an yeah. option to re-up yeah. on shit. Oh goodness! Yeah, well, and okay. you could use technically you could use Valindra's magic circle to fast travel to Nyan Zaru. Da 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 da. Uh, da. Yeah, you know, um, on a technical sense, I guess we could yeah. do that shit off air as well. Um, one of these times, but. But yeah, you guys need a, a place to spend your money, essentially, because that's that's the one thing in this campaign that I feel is kind of difficult is the whole money thing. And we had the same thing kind of in Abyss too. Yeah, um, just yeah. that whole setting where money is tough to spend. <laughs> well, not yeah. only that, it makes it difficult to care about money yeah. and loot. I mean, right. I haven't had a single character so far that's given a shit about money. Um, it just so happens that my builds kind of aren't that type so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it it also it it just doesn't really matter, you know. I think that yeah, even if I isn't... built a character that way, eventually I'd start to be like, okay, this is important. I right. need this, you know. But it's um, I haven't experienced the need yet. Well, and some adventures lend themselves to dropping like important drops that characters would want like ooh this is awesome for a wizard or this is awesome for a paladin or whatever and this isn't that kind of adventure at least not yet not not where we've gotten to yet mm -hmm. and that there's nothing wrong with that but at the same time when you're trying to gear up for what's coming ahead even if it's something as simple as healing potions or magic in, in general, like I'd kill for a plus one at this point because I don't think Quincy has any magic attacks. Yeah. Yep. So like being able to have a merchant around would be awesome. Yeah. I think you found your first uh, magic, the ring of protection. Yeah, yep. that like, was episode. You know this, thirty-eight or thirty-nine or something like yeah, that. Yeah, this is where I mean, oh, I think Omu is where it kind of. There's a few locations throughout Chult. It just so happens you 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 didn't touch on any of them. Whether it be my fault for not really pushing you guys in that direction but there's a few magic items littered throughout the lands in various locations that you could have obtained nothing too crazy um but i think this is where all the good stuff uh going forward mm -hmm. is is hidden you know in the tomb of annihilation all right so we meet riga yeah you've met riga and that part that kind of goes in line of what i was just talking about there's a lot of this place is an attraction yeah, it's and a he destination was he was with the tabaxi. Um, but he at least, he wasn't with them. No. But, but he tried to join them. Yep. Yes. Right. And we were led to him because we were told that somebody needed help. Yep. Yes. And so we went to where we heard voices, where we thought there were going to be people. Yep. Yeah. As it turned out, it was Akramas who needed, who needed the, help, the help, not right. Rega. Who we met shortly Rega after. Was just, yeah. Yeah. He, he was just there by circumstance. Um, anything you wanted to, anything about Riga apart from him just being a completely likable character? <laughs> um, I mean, it's it just kind of right place, right time uh, situation. I wanted you guys to have more people at your disposal because I always feel that as as PCs level up, the scope or the range of the adventure uh, gets larger as well. Whereas early game, the focus is on the characters performing tasks or missions or quests. Or, or tasks and missions, and then it moves into a quest or several quests. And then as that progresses, I like to think of you guys or the adventurers building a network or, and then having people to send out on their missions and tasks. And, you know, this way you kind of get a, get a larger sense of becoming more than just higher level. You're actually becoming leaders. Yeah, and this actually... In the older editions of D&D, &D, when you hit certain levels, you would attract followers. And for every class, they had different types of followers ah, that you would attract. So it's kind of interesting in that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting in that regard. Yeah. But it also reminds me of like some games where maybe you have like a pool of NPCs to choose from. So when you go into the dungeon and one or two of them die, then you got to go back, you go, go back sure. to your headquarters or whatever, the inn or whatever it might be. And yeah. You just grab one of the other ones. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or if it's Skyrim, you just accidentally kill them all the time. 
so it's a mixture of both. So like video game developers, I think anyway, have evolved because they had that feature for a while, switching out yeah. party members. But then they realized somebody uh, along the way realized these idle party members aren't doing shit. So right. then you started seeing the the ability to send those idle guys off on little passive quests that might take that take time like he'll be gone for 15 minutes and then and then if he right. succeeds you'll get this much reward or something like that you know so so I'm yeah I'm taking a page out of that um I guess you could say uh to where I just wanted to kind of build you guys' roster up a bit uh have the ability to send people out the whole thing with um, well, I don't, I don't want to jump ahead, um, but yeah, that's that's that. So the biggest things after uncovering um, Akramas was uh, he dropped some information on us, um, and I think it's just worth mentioning. He tells us that Rosnasi is heading up the Uwanti. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was the first time you guys heard that Rosnasi is actually alive. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and present yeah. before you, that. Uh, Pat Legend. on the back here did a great job with like dropping his name in certain areas. You know, is he dead? We don't know. Nobody knows what happened to him. Yeah, some do, people do think he's long gone. Yeah, village that we first I heard. Gonna, of. Oh, that's I was just gonna ask. Do you guys remember when you first heard it was? Uh, it was. It was in Taguda Village. Sybil. Either Sybil or Sybil. the room or the. Walls, whatever or the, the walls. story in the walls. Yeah. yeah, or did Sybil read the wall to us or help us decipher the wall? I almost she showed up. I almost want to say his name was first dropped as you, when you guys went up the lift and you guys were jumped by the Uwanti up top and and the pure blood said wow. something uh, like yeah. you well, dare disturb the final resting place of Rasnasi or something. May like that. maybe. Maybe, but I thought there might have been something in the tomb itself. Yeah, I think there was something in the tomb. Then when we got up from the tomb, and then once again in Wakanga's library, it was discussed. Wakanga's library was discussed, but I think down in the tomb, you guys could be right on this. It's been fucking forever. Uh, but I want to say, just off my own shitty memory, that below the tomb, you guys learned of the fate of Omu. Um, which Rosnes he took no part in. Mm. We didn't know. We didn't hear the story of the undead marching on the city. On Mesro, no. that was Mesro. That, you the learned that in Wakanga's library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. This you guys learned the fate of Omu when Uptau turned his back on the people. Essentially, the right. story that Akramas uh, relayed to you guys is that where you were getting to. Yep. Yeah. So Akramas, he you know tells us about Rosnes he heading up the Uwanti. Then he also drops on us the Zorbo myth, mm -hmm. which was a lot to digest, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that um, as we explore Omu, there's going to be a lot of mythology for us to remember yeah. and decipher, um, which is awesome for me anyway. I love stuff like that. Um, yeah, but, but I don't remember anything after like three beers deep. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. that's the thing is the storage of it. It's, it's fun to learn about. Um, but I, but I mean, I say beers, but it. really it's like by the time it gets to be like 11 o'clock at night, you know, it, it gets harder to retain. Everything Absolutely. I actually think that like maybe we should all start kind of having copies of the myths as we acquire them um, as they're known to our characters, not anything mm. beforehand, but as right, they're known right. for us to kind of look at mm. and recall once in a while. Yeah. Jay does a good job of posting uh you know, we have a private Facebook group and sometimes that type of information is, is posted in the group. And then, of course, he tells us of the nine shrines. Mm -hmm. I couldn't recall if he tells us about the cubes that reside in the nine shrines or if he just gave us kind of a rundown of the nine shrine thing. I don't remember if he knew specifically about the puzzle cubes um so, so much it was for akramas it was mostly about the shrines he had started studying uh two of the nine shrines one was shigambi but he didn't get very far in shigambi i feel like maybe he might have been maybe the one to give us the info on the puzzle cubes because how else i don't know how else we would have known yeah yeah, he was probably the one that gave us the information. I just wasn't sure if it was in that moment. Right. Oh, right. Well, it was. That's all. Right. There was also another data drop. Um, 
you guys first went to Shigambi, fought the Commandants, and had to go back and lick your wounds, rest for the night. And that, and uh, there was a yeah. whole lot of information spilled that night with Sybil, uh, Zavril getting taken. Um, yeah. A lot happened there. Yeah. So, well, episode 37 is the Commandant fight. Mm-hmm. And essentially, that's a lot of just what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but in that, though, Irime falls in battle for the first time. Yes. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, you got knocked unconscious. Yeah. Yeah, she played it safe pretty much for a long time. Yeah, and point. you know what? Oh, I mentioned it um probably I don't know if it was episode 37 or episode 38, but I remember reiterating that like I knew I should have just taken flight. Like I should have just Yeah. In Irame's situation even for a wizard or a sorceress, she's just vulnerable she does she has got 25 total hit points <laughs> like yeah you've been pretty con- con- consistently uh rolling terrible on hit points yes um so she didn't and she went down mm-hmm. which was uh it was shaky i remember there was you, you guys got the, your first magical item dropped the ring of protection Irma pretty much uh you passed the perception check you spotted it first you pretty much clutched it was, and was that not until after we came back though yes right no, yeah no but it was uh, honestly that was the reward for beating the commandants you know what i yep. mean so right. i just you know if we're talking about the commandant fight and you know uh i think it's safe to bring it up now but so you clutched onto that you latched onto it you pretty much gave no there was no no, no chance no. that there was going to be a roll off no <laughs> I I took that and and I understood it. I didn't, you know, it wasn't in the moment. It wasn't a thing. But listening back and editing, there was definitely you could hear it a little bit in in the others' voices here and there, in jest mostly. Um, the reason why I saw it the way it was and it made sense uh, is because Arame has been rolling pretty consistently shitty on hit points uh, and also your recent brush with death. You're the most vulnerable. Yeah, that was definitely her argument. Um, I think that if it had like progressed in any way, if anyone, you know, if if there was any kind of pushback on it, um, more than in jest, I like might have brought up the fact that, like I said, Irame never tries to take anything. Mm-hmm. You know, she is mm-hmm. never, you know, whatever comes along is up for grabs for anyone else. Um, that was just. Yeah, I, I kind of like um, so loot stuff like that. Always, like it's inevitable that sometimes people contest loot, and the roll oh, off yeah. is the classic mm-hmm. way to resolve it. But I mean, there's always that certain, especially with like rings of protection, they usually go to the casters and the squishy characters because they can't wear armor, right, and such. Um, but if it does come down to some sort of like people making a case at the very least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like the idea of doing it like in character maybe. It makes it a lot more fun anyway. Yeah. That's for sure. And I think it makes you think about it in a different way too. Absolutely. <clears throat> Anybody familiar with uh, MMOs and, and their rating systems and stuff like that is uh, they use a system. Uh, it was uh, called D- uh, DKP. And essentially, you when you attended a raid, everybody who attended got this much DKP. And then when you get through the first boss, every, everybody who participated gets this much more DKP. Um, and then if something drops that they want, it's their class item, they would then bid against everyone else. All the other enchanters would bid their DKP. And whoever won it deducts their DKP so the next time an item drops for enchanters, they have right, less points right. to bid. So it kind of it makes it a little bit more fair. So I was thinking about doing a similar system to where if another ring of or another caster item drops or something like that, Irame would have less points to bid with, or you know. Uh, so Copernicus, for example, being right. a warlock, would would have more points, so he would ultimately be able to outbid her and get that item. I mean, we're almost all casters to a degree right absolutely right. yeah, I was, yeah I was it's, just using other than uh zavril is probably the closest thing to a martial character that he's a martial character yeah i was just using the cash thing as a right. loose example uh, it would be but more so is, anybody who wants the item right, would have right, to right. bid points 
Um, but it is a good example of a of a new player because, like, in my mind, a roll off wasn't even a thing. Like in my mind, I was looking at us as a whole. Yeah. And I was looking at the party as a whole, and I was the weak link, and so I should have it because I was the weak yeah, link if th- we all want to survive. But I, I definitely see though how like if, if we had to like stop recording and be like, no, Chrissy, you just can't take the things that you want. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I guess you're right. I can't do that. Um, I mean, I think. But there at the are same time, layers. as a player, I think that if someone, if we were to have found a magical item, yep. I would have been like, okay, I'm pretty fucking magical already. I don't need that. Right, right. Um, but, you know, definitely different character or different players and player styles. Um, it didn't even dawn on me. I mean, I think there are multiple layers to the the loot decision. And sometimes it's like the first, the first uh, pass is like, all right, well, what character does this loot make sense for? And that's just like a common way of playing, right? Yeah, right, sure. And then, uh, and then after that, it's like, all right, well, maybe it makes sense for more than one person, or maybe it's really useful for more than one person. Mm-hmm. So then there's the whole like, well, of those two or three people, like, is there one person that's already been kind of getting a lot of the loot? Sure. Yeah, and if there's you a know, plus and... one to AC, that's useful for anyone. Yeah, right. At the yep. end of the day, Absolutely. you know. Yep. So like, even when, <laughs> even like, I wouldn't have even known you guys weren't in jest. Like, I thought we were just doing it for flavor. <laughs> 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 like, I thought that was just like Swainy playing Copernicus and you playing Quincy. You know what I mean? <laughs> It would have like been a thing, and I would have been like, "Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa! This is a thing." Oh yeah, no, okay, we can roll off. That's well, I fine. Went ho- I went home and put the picture of Irme on my dartboard, st- <laughs> stabbed it like three With a times. The ring hanging there. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. She's not even in combat <laughs> ever. <laughs> that's true. Oh, but I didn't but, uh, even think of it. I thought it was just flavor. I was like, "Ha ha, that's funny." No. <laughs> No, but I think that but going back to the the idea that, you know, there's more than one consideration when you start looking at the loot thing. And I think most of the time it just sort of resolves and that something like a roll off or a point system or something like an auction kind of thing is sort of like the last resort, you know. Mm-hmm. Most of the time it's, I mean, some parties are more difficult than others. but Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is is who you're playing with and being aware of who you're playing with is important, yeah. you know, um, to avoid conflicts if there's actually going to be any. Um, I don't think we really need to worry about it too much. Yeah, some things just make sense. If it yeah. was a rape here, I mean, nobody else, or if, if, or if it was a whip, you know, if it was a whip, it would make sense that Zabril would have it. But it right. also calls into question if, okay, so as a player, if you know that somebody else having that item is what's best for the party as a whole but if your character is selfish or if yeah. you're care- you know do you do you just uh, which road do you take do you play your character out and 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 try to really put up a case for keeping it or do you try to come up with a reason that your character would not see want so the some item? people who play thieves will try to actually steal some loot or hide loot and you know at a certain time period in my gaming history, I thought that was kind of fun. But I think these days it's more of a, I think it's fine for everybody to sort of make a case. And I think like if you have a thief or a really selfish character or greedy character, then it makes sense to play the character to try to gain more stuff or to keep something. But maybe if you play it in a way that you express that desire, but you don't without actually succeed. like, yeah, without actually like impeding how the party progresses, then mm. you know that might be a good way to handle it. Just sort of play it out a little bit, but ultimately forfeit, you know, to what makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think that covers loot. Yeah, <laughs> give me the loot. Give me the loot. <laughs> what, what I we... can talk about loot for hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do we got next? All right, so Booty next, too. <laughs> ultimately, unless there was anything else during the Commodon fight that you two thought was worth mentioning, that kind of sums up episode 37. Episode 38 basically begins with Irame's vision of Rosnacy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Irame's vision of Rosnacy, I actually had a question about it. Uh, listening back when I listened to it, something I should have picked up on immediately but didn't, she's watching the undead wave take down the city of Mesro. 
Or attack it, yes. Or attack it. Attack the city of Mesro. Yeah. And while she's seeing that, you mention um, the fire of vengeance mm -hmm. in Rosnessy's eyes. Now, is that something we can know? That you can tell us right now what the vengeance is for? Is that something that will be revealed later? Yeah, I or think is that something that you could uh, you could tell us why he sought vengeance on the city? No, it's a it's a great question, and it was a detail that was purposefully put in. Uh, it, it, and I did put it in because Rosnessy's story is uh, being revealed over time in the f in those. You kind don't of have forms. to tell us. I just didn't know if it was right. Right. Oh no, I mean, I'll, I'll, no, I mean, I'm explaining. Um, I'm just explaining that there is that his story is going to be revealed in such manners going forward, whether it be through his own dialogue or through similar visions like that um you're picking up pieces uh, of the history of this character and i don't want anything to get lost because it's easy for stuff to get lost absolutely yeah so where where i think you guys may have missed a piece i just try to to throw it in where i see it where where I can, you know. Mm. I um I love when the vengeance is thrown in with a villain because it's it humanizes them. Like now we're gonna find out what happened to him eventually, mm. you know. Yeah, I mean, what in the, made Rosnessy? Yeah, in, in the vision he was wearing glorious armor. He was he he was also human, and, and he was and handsome, handsome and radiated divinity. You know, so he was clearly a person who was close to divinity. He was, mm. he was close to a god. Essentially and, fell from grace type right, of story. And, and you guys know that the only god that was even welcome in Chult was, was Uptau. So he must have been a devout follower of Uptau at some point in his life. And clearly with, with the fires of vengeance in his eyes and his failed attack, you also learned that that attack had failed in in Wakanga's library. Oh, yeah, that's right. So yeah, we uh we get a nice view of Rosnessy, which is pretty cool. It's like our villain is taking shape or one of the main villains, who knows if it's even the actual <laughs> huge problem. Uh then the next big thing here, uh, we so we return back to camp cuz Irime is just the battle took its toll and then the vision, she's vomiting, she's in rough shape. And so we head back to camp and Sybil makes an appearance. Zavril gets taken that, oh, that yeah, night. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm right. out of order. <laughs> Actually, before even heading back to camp, I want to mention Zavril saving the baby Commodores. Uh. <laughs> um, I, you know what, though? Like, uh, that was great. I thought yeah. that was like an awesome human moment for Zavril, who's yeah. always kind of cold, uh, standoffish. I thought that was a really awesome moment for him. Um, yeah, I I think if I wish he was here to talk on it, but um, I th what I took from that is Zavril is a is a ranger. He's a he's an undead hunter, so you don't always see that. But there are some staple ranger characteristics that he latches onto. Uh, you know the 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 tracking, the being in the forest, and having all of these sort of ranger abilities, and he do, that he does utilize and use, other than just the whole hunter aspect. I think he does a great job at taking the both of them while keeping them separate, still kind of making them flow well together. And that was just another one of those ranger sides that that I thought that he he just grabbed onto. You know, where you heard Copernicus immediately. He was joking around, of course, but he was like, I'll throw him off into the lava, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know damn well, you know, you heard him. Zavril's like, uh, are we just going to leave these guys? Like, I kind of feel like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Irime, my character, like, Irime revels in the moments where she sees Zavril look human. Right. Uh, yeah. When she learned that he had a family and when he's saving the Commodons, she loves those moments. She thinks they're great. You know, she wants to like tussle his hair. <laughs> I think uh, when Zavril started talking about his family early on, that's when Quincy started to call him Mr. Don Tracker. Yeah. Yep. And I don't even know if that was deliberate or not. <laughs> it just started <laughs> happening. Yep. 
Yeah, so he goes and releases the commandants on the outskirts of the city. Which makes, in my opinion, for uh, like just storytelling in general, like the reading of a story, uh, when a character does something like that that's so redeeming and so human, and then a horrible thing happens to him, and then he's taken from us. Yeah. That's just awesome storytelling, in my opinion. I I like when stuff like that happens. Yeah. Um. So Zavril gets kidnapped. With that, the, the Yuwanti patrol that you guys first, that was chasing the fairy dragon, that it's written that that patrol essentially is going to stalk the party as they enter Omu. And at the first sign where, where they see an opportunity, they try to kidnap somebody out of the party, if not the whole party, right? And that's pretty much their objective. Um, and I, you know, obviously, I took things in a little bit of a different way. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to bring the fairy dragon back, and that whole kidnapping is part of that story arc. Like I said, I don't want. I think there's a lot of cool things, and and some things I'm I'm okay with being one or the other. But if there's two really fucking cool things, I'm gonna try to make it so I so we can get both of you them. You can explore both. <laughs> yeah. You know. And that was just a way of me doing it. It sucks kind of splitting the party like that, but at the same time, it made sense to me, obviously, because I have a, the big picture view of it all. But I think it's also going to be a cool thing, um, getting getting to see that story arc, getting to hear it throughout the episode. Uh, while you guys are doing this, you're still kind of hearing that. Even though you can't take that in character, it's still cool to hear. As, yeah. yeah, I think um, as a player and and for our listeners, you know, mm. to kind of get that that perspective from from inside the belly of the beast, as it were. And that leads to Sybil's appearance, which is <clears throat> epic as always. I mean, I thought like it was like Sybil actually walked into where we were recording <laughs> because of how uh, <laughs> Swain's reacted. Right, Cappy was so happy. Yeah, well, you know? we haven't heard from her in a yeah. long time. Swainy yeah. was so he was like stammering and shit. He was so excited, <laughs> he was bumbling. Yeah, yeah, he was so excited. <laughs> he was. Um, we all were. I well, I yeah. was anyway. I love seeing Sybil. I think she's a great character. Mm. Um, yeah, I I do I do like the Sybil Copernicus dynamic. I like how it's yeah. it's. I like how she treats him. And in turn, how he, we, we already talked about this, mm -hmm. but it's worth mentioning again. I just love how they're so intertwined that it, it like bleeds out in Copernicus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and through Sybil, Cappy, this is another huge moment in the show. As far as character development goes, Cappy learns of Zabriel's interest in Sybil. Yes. That was a pretty big moment. Um, the way Sybil played it was interesting was that, um, and maybe I could have been wrong in how I was interpreting it so far, but Sybil played it like Zavril was hunting her, uh, like she was going to be some sort of trophy for him or something, like he wanted to kill her. And it's possible that I missed something because as players we often do, but I didn't interpret it as Zavril hunting her. I just took it as Zavril being interested in what the relationship was because he thought it was a threat. Mm. Sure. I, I think what it what it comes down to is Zavril is an undead hunter. And if if he has reason to believe that Sybil is an undead, you know, he's gonna kill her. It, you know, there's just no I mean, I don't want to say that for sure. I, you know, Zavril's his own character, but from an outsider's point of view, especially if you are Sybil and this undead hunter has taken interest in you and you have and you reek of the shadow fell um you also got to take Sib what sybil says you know kind of tongue-in-cheek yeah. she's she's a, a bit of an instigator obviously so it's fair for sybil to assume that zavril is trying to hunt her trying to kill her actively well i think she even says uh because i think she even says you know and i'm paraphrasing that zavril believes she's something that she's not so mm -hmm. you know there's there's room for there's room for debate there's room for a conversation but yeah that's out there and yeah it might you know obviously when you know in, in the in the moment copernicus stated that it pissed him off and that he's gonna have this this anger towards zavril but you know, honestly, that kind of shit happens all the time. Uh, you got 
a character who was taken. Copernicus can be pissed at him all he wants, but Zavril's not there. <laughs> you know, Zavril's a prisoner of war at this point. You know, and we'll we'll see what happens when they meet back up again. It might be under dire circumstances. You guys might be tied up next to him. It's hard to believe that there would be no joy in Copernicus to find that Zavril was alive and and okay. Yeah, like the reunion would be strictly antagonistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to believe that it would be like that. Right. Um but but you never know. I mean, uh Copernicus is pretty tied in. He's he's pretty invested in Sybil and uh there's no there's no reasoning with him as Quincy knows. <laughs> yeah. Not now, Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Which leads us to episode 39 uh, with Zavril behind enemy lines, right? Yeah. He's with the Uwanti. Um, it also brings us to Charlie's Uwanti character. Oh. So this is uh, this is all you Ooh, guys. Oh, shit. Are we going to talk about A brief it? glimpse of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is all you two. And what do you think? Did, do we want to... Uh... How much do we want to dive into this, or do we still want to kind of? We keep at least it need as... to broach the subject upon lo- where you know Charlie is playing a Uanti, um, and what that's like, and all that other jazz. <laughs> well, it's also my first female D and D character. Yeah, th- yeah. Ever. There's a, there's quite a couple. There's quite a few things we could so, talk about without delving too deep. Right, right. I've so I've mostly always play humans, mm-hmm. and. I've never played a female character. I've played female characters in video games and stuff, but that's sure. entirely different. So I wasn't quite sure like how to how to do the voice. I've GM'd though and never even thought about how how I do female NPCs as voices. But for some reason trying to play a female character, I was like, "Well, what am I going to do with the voice?" You know, I stressed about it a little bit more. <laughs> and Kristen, my partner, was like, "How are you going to do the f- a female voice?" <laughs> <laughs> She's like, do it, do it now. Well, because she thinks every time I mimic her, that I do it in insult- uh, <laughs> an yeah. insulting way, condescending like sort a- of way. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that bad, <laughs> but yeah. So it was, uh, it was a different kind of character for me to play all together, and then. It must be great having Kristen because because she's versed. She she's familiar with. Uh, D and D RPGs, oh, yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So um, it's it's definitely. I mean, I know with, with Christy and I, it is nice having that. You know, those out of game talks. You could get advice from that person. Oh yeah, and, you and can, she listens to the show, and like yeah, I nice. definitely get perspective from her about what we're doing. Yeah. Um. So it is great. Um. Where was I going? Oh, and female voices. So well, not well, just playing a di- an entirely different character. The thing that I like most about this new character and and we don't know much about her yet uh but the thing i do like most about her is that she is kind of in the in the villain camp mm-hmm. right i mean maybe she maybe she's you know there are different kinds of villains and we don't know much about her personal motives yet yeah but, but the best ones are women <laughs> <laughs> that's true i don't know rosna sees a fucking cool villain <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, so no, villains I, are fun in general for sure. I like the idea of being in the villain camp, like belonging to a faction that isn't part of like the oh, let's save the world, you mm-hmm. know. Uh they definitely have their own, she has her own motives and and it has nothing to do with like she doesn't really care about the death curse or anything like that and she's not trying to save the world. Mm-hmm. Um sorry to interrupt, but it made me think of, you know when you've seen an actor play a protagonist so many times and then you see that you know you see a trailer for a movie coming out where they're a villain it's exciting you don't know how they're gonna do you don't know how they're gonna do and then you watch it and they're like better at it you know (laughs) they're so good at it it's like wow right right um it's it's funny to think that like maybe you'd be better at a villain you know you're a great D &D player but maybe if you played a evil D &D, you could you know some people One of the greatest, things. they have said. <laughs> 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 You're already going down that dark path. <laughs> right. No, but I think it like it, it actually got me thinking. If I if I GM something, I haven't GM'd maybe since the spring, but if I GM another uh, adventure, I was wondering maybe like maybe I should GM an, a, a a villainous one. Have everybody play villains. I don't know. It's it could be fun. Could be fun. No, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's definitely doable. 
But in terms of Zavril being behind enemy lines, uh, obviously we're not going to have like a straight up PVP situation. So uh, in this case, uh, my character is there to help facilitate Zavril's story in this regard. And I'm still playing Quincy. So who knows how big a role this character will end up having. But, but she's there. She's out there. Yeah, you know, kind of goes in with what I was talking about earlier is getting 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 that perspective out while this just getting two sides of the story um, at the same time, getting a double dose um, of a parallel story is always a cool thing. And you know what? That's actually like instead of just having a straight up villain campaign, maybe I'll have everybody roll two characters, one hero and one villain. Ooh. And we go back and forth. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that way, like, it, you're playing both sides. Yeah. That could be fun. And then it ends in, like, a battle royale. With me. <laughs> <laughs> It'd have to have some way. Yeah, it would be tough to fight against your own characters. But Could just everybody fucking get on dinosaurs and do dino races. <laughs> well, yeah, or, I mean, it could be. I was even thinking it could be something not even the players fighting, but whatever they've built toward like one thing beats another somehow, you know, so an, an, an indirect conflict could even just draw them all, put them in a hat and everybody picks characters Who they're playing to play. for the final battle. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. There's actually, I don't want to go too far cause we might be doing a, uh, continuation of the abyss campaign, but oh, there's something yeah. like that in the, there's something like that in there. A little teaser for you. That'd be fun. And we're going to be putting the Abyss episodes on our Patreon yeah. soon, soonish. Soonish, yep. Yep. That's it's me. It's uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of work getting them, getting them ready. No, on. I bet. I mean, there were we had rough equipment yep. and no experience. We had one equipment. <laughs> we had one equipment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I put a nice little disclaimer before it, but uh, it'll it'll get there. We're we're um, chipping away at it week to week. Um, yep. What else we got on the cards? We got Wesson. Uh, Wesson. Oh yeah, when did we meet Wesson? <laughs> Around this time. Around this. <laughs> Wesson always makes me want to sing Destiny's Child. <laughs> <clears throat> so Zavril gets taken. We get the perspective on Zavril and uh, Chuck's alternate uh, yeah. character in with Zavril's disappearance comes Wesson uh, entering Omu retired gladiator so essentially I wanted to get this these this dual story out because I didn't want one to get missed but at the same time I didn't want to break the party up you know so so we brought in Dustin to play Wesson and yeah so in comes Wesson, the retired gladiator. And uh, I think it went well with Wesson. It, it goes back to Omu being a destination for many reasons. And um, you, you guys also heard a little bit of his tale of, of a path you didn't go. He, he came from Oralunga um, mm. and, and he parted ways. He, he journeyed with artist Simber. Um, so there was some familiarity there. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting having a completely new person at the table, you know, sort of jump in midway through what we've, you know, we've been sort of building this campaign for a while, and it's it's not, it's nice to get new blood in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, is he a permanent addition, or? No, I mean, not, 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 um, how can I say it? We didn't agree to a permanent position. Yeah. It was mostly yeah. just, you know, this kind of temporary fill-in while we're doing this thing with Zavril. Um, right, so we I have another... I think it would be a, a great permanent addition. Yeah, I wouldn't... If, if that... That's ultimately his choice. I mean, yeah. you, you guys know, I would... Even if Zavril came back and, and he wanted to keep playing, uh, th there's no way I would say no. Uh, absolutely not, you know. It's, it's entirely up to him. He has his own things going on, and we haven't really talked about uh, a, a permanent setup uh, yet, but... Yeah, for, but as of right now, though, um, he's in it to win it. Is it worth mentioning that Dustin's a third marshal? <laughs> <laughs> There's three three marshal brothers now. Yeah, the the brothers marshal. All right, you're a marshal too. Oh, 
<laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> your ritual ceremony <laughs> yeah. brought you into injection. the Marshall Clan. Rob. Okay, <laughs> the High Priest of Canaan inducted <laughs> you into. The <laughs> oh my God, poor Swainy. Should be thankful we didn't make you a brood guard. <laughs> <laughs> She kind of is. I mean, <laughs> you have a brood. I, I have we a do brood, have three and kids. I do guard them. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> so I'm you got actually, something going on with your I'm, eyes I'm there. I'm having, What's, um, we live in New England, and I am having the worst allergy attack <laughs> in the history of fucking allergy attacks. I can't even open my eyeballs right now. They itch and sting and you're making my eyes hurt i know i'm <laughs> sorry it's i i don't even want to open them i don't Do you know need if your I, am i near the braille? mic am i need them am i near it i can't read braille <laughs> 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 so essentially upon meeting wesson right we leave the camp and we travel back to the temple of shigami yeah, you you get you get further directions. Yeah. Uh, you obviously you immediately you, Zim would be and Riga split off. Like that's that's kind of a thing. Oh yeah, um, that's to be mentioned. You do that. I gotta. Be, well, yeah, uh, Zavril is missing. That's obviously an immediate thing. But but then it, it's brought to your attention that now there now there's a little bit of a race going on for these puzzle cubes. Um, so yeah, I mean that had to have been a tough decision. Yeah, it's worth mentioning about characters, like for the sake of the campaign and the adventure versus what you think your character would actually do. Would our characters have actually um, gone after Zavril? Potentially. I mean, we didn't ultimately. Mm. So we're kind of, it's not just, we're not handcuffed to a preconceived notion of what our characters are. Our characters are evolving in how we express them. Mm. And in this particular case, we express them as continuing on our quest. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a topic that was thrown out for discussion, and, and yeah. everybody discussed it in detail. And I think it was ultimately decided this way in in through your character's um, dialogue. And and maybe like if we get all nine puzzle cubes, and Zabriel still hasn't rejoined us, <laughs> we go after him. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think like for Irame, it was very easily rational like it it was easy for her to decide to continue on towards the puzzle cubes because it's her father um had yeah. before they left for this journey um had she not learned that her father was dying of the death curse she might have put up more of a stink to go after zabril well also no. zim would be in riga very uh, selfish went reasons. after him so it's not that you just it's we didn't we completely didn't that ignore was part the of situation. It. Exactly. Yeah. That I think that was worth mentioning. That was a part of the decision is you at least have somebody on the trail. That's part of what gathering. we're going to tell Zavril when he finds out we didn't right. go after him. <laughs> well, we sent some more BF after you. <laughs> no, but like it's not just like role playing is not just about like confining yourself to this idea of like this rigid set of behavior for your character. Part of it's being able to justify uh, why your character's moving forward with what's obviously the adventure. Right. You know, it's growth. Um, it is obviously different situations. Your character is going to uh, ch change it through experiences, uh, much like people do in real life. You know, thing I, I've also, I've noticed a similar change in Irame, uh with Akramas. I mean, Irame was completely anti Akramas. For the first time in Natty 19 history, Arame was not very welcoming to the Red Wizard. <laughs> yeah, well, she wasn't very welcoming to Anit either. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, that was, was more in jest out, outside right, of our right, gameplay. Right. Actually, in game, and, Arame and, was... Uh, right. And to be fair, she was also dealing with uh, the stress of her mother showing up. Yep. And there was a lot going on there. I think that for Irame, falling in battle... And then getting that vision, she's unraveling a little bit. Uh, she had spent time, and since she's been with this party, her new friends, her new family, essentially, she has grown and she's become more confident in battle. I've expressed in previous episodes leading up to the Omu episodes about how she almost gets giddy with excitement now when something mm. starts to happen. Um, she became more confident, and as with anything... You become confident and then you get knocked down and it shakes you. She's becoming an adrenaline junkie. Yeah, yeah. 
and then got a smack of reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not cool. Um, and so she fell in battle and then she had that vision um, and that vision racked her. Um, John really made that, you know, it wasn't just like she saw something and then came to and she fainted. She was vomiting. It shook her body. And shit's really gone wrong since. Yeah. It's shit's gone wrong for Irame since we've entered Omu and met Akramas. And maybe she's just taking that out on him. Yeah, because or maybe you're not she... taking it out on Rega. You love Rega. Yeah, I love Rega. <laughs> so. <laughs> poor Akramas is getting the brunt of Irame's bullshit. Well, it's there not is something just fishy poor about Akramas. Him anyway. There's something fishy about him. He, you know, he's. Is he or isn't he a red wizard? He survived the massacre of the red wizard. Survived the massacre and the red wizard. But would in have general? He, but would have he survived if you guys didn't show up? He was at, yeah, maybe he, was at he death wouldn't store. have. But there's also something to be said about someone who immediately denounces the party that they were with. Yeah, and even yeah, the red wizards themselves we held in sort of a dubious, a light. dubious regard. So what? So he's either part of the red wizards and kind of dubious for that reason, or he just immediately rejects the people he was with which kind of makes him a little bit what's to stop him from when yeah. he meets a party stronger than he us is a little fishy. or an opponent better than us that he's not like i'm not with them well no you but know? he's a little he squirmy was, yeah. he was pretty clear though about his passion um and i think i think and i'm taking this from a player's if if he was if absolutely I was on the clear the about table, his passion but just you know, because he has a passion doesn't mean he's not a little doesn't mean he's not the guy from the mummy I mean, Bill Cosby had a passion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about, but his passion was a very, that was an understandable, I mean, you got to look at it from the 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 realistic angle. If you were a scholar and Chult was full of this, this, this ancient lore, but the price to Chult was so steep, I mean, yeah. you would see this. This is, you know, this is, no, his story you're going to get your ticket. His away. story doesn't right. have any holes in it. And I respect that, but and he was pretty honest about it. It's, it's scummy, yeah, yeah but, but he didn't we don't lie know. about it. But we don't know, right? But it, his story was scummy, right? Yeah. I mean, he he essentially, you know, bought on with the Red Wizards to get free passage to Chult, uh, to to you know Omu or Chult and Omu, yep. you know. But anyway, so you guys moving on to the Shigambi Shrine. What do you guys think of this fight? I mean, you guys were at a critical point. Um, well, first, before the fight, I just want to insert a quick comment. I'm so glad I finally got to use the goddamn knock spell, oh, even though yeah, it didn't appear to sure. do anything. <laughs> Absolutely. I've seen that spell multiple times come through in decks, and oh, yeah. uh, I've always wanted to equip it. But if you if it's tough to switch out spells... And you choose that one, and you uh, never get to use yeah. it. It sucks. <laughs> so and it's very situational. It is cool. very situational. Mm. But in any case, yeah. So didn't appear to have an effect. And then we do get into this uh, combat with these golems, these uh, clay gladiators, yeah. gladiators, clay gladiators. Yeah. Episode thirty nine ends with us triggering the trap, and episode forty opens with with the battle. Yep. It's well. They're, my impression of them so far is that they're heavy hitters. I mean, they have three attacks. The shield has the prone. Like you get a pass a strength save or go prone. Quincy has no friggin' strength, you know. Um, and there are four of them. How many of us are there? <laughs> five. Yeah. Six. Five. Five. Yep. There's five of you. Right, and we're, we're, you know, none of us are very strong martial characters. We have the um, Wesson. Wesson and Copernicus. Yeah, really. but we're going in with but Wesson Copernicus and not even really warlock. knowing he's what he's capable really of. Yeah, but he's a melee warlock. You know? Yeah, sort of. He's definitely built for melee. He has to yeah, combine. He has to combine his spells and hexes with right. his melee in order to be effective. But still, it, I mean, he he he's capable of getting his AC up to nineteen. Um, but it's not automatic. It's not a given. So those well, first no, couple but, rounds of combat, you know, you know are tricky for sure, somebody like sure. him. But know. once he gets wound up, though, he's probably the more formidable of the martial yeah. classes. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a tough situation going into it. It gave everybody inspirations going into it. and Yeah, which I thought was pretty generous and was like, I don't know how I felt about it, though. You know, when you like, 
get rewarded for something you don't feel like you don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think we deserved it, so I was like, eh. What do you mean? I, I don't know. This is the first inspiration I gave you guys, 40 episodes. Well, yeah, I guess it, maybe because I don't have it in my head associated with something specific. Right. You know? The the whole inspiration thing, I mean, you guys started this adventure at level three. Yeah. Um, I knew the jungle. If, if you start at level one going through the jungles up to this point you know what i mean i bet you you know there would have been more inspiration i just didn't see really a need to give you guys inspiration or advantage I mean, you guys didn't really have all too much of a hard time going through you had a couple couple close calls here and there yeah, I mean, but that definitely was, had characters get knocked down yeah but it, i don't think there was any real saves. fear of like uh permanent death or something like that well, there might have been one or two but yeah not a lot not a lot um but going into this fight i knew damn well that even with the inspiration now is this just because of um knowledge that you have of the encounter and you're looking at what our party composition is and looking at the encounter and thinking well this might be a pretty tough one for it them. is it is it's, well it's it's a little bit of it's a little bit of everything it's the difficulty of the fight it's i haven't rewarded you guys inspirations yet you, there hasn't been any you guys missed a few magical items that you that you could have had coming into here you know i mean there's i was trying to rack my brain as to why this fight is so hard and this is hard um historically for other groups yeah yeah yep. and and a lot of a lot of suggestions were you know well does did your party get this magical item did this you know on the way right, up right. to this point you know and there, there was a whole lot of back and forth that i've dug into uh that i've that i've come upon which is tricky because then sometimes it turns into a game for the gm to have to be like all right, I want to make sure that I steer them in this direction or put this magic item in this place. Right, that reposition at. magical items. Right? Yeah, and and uh, that's not always a fun thing to do. No. At the same time, I don't want to jip you guys either. Um, right. And it's tough for our party specifically because we're not – we don't do a lot of the metagamey like let's let's clear this area and loot every possible thing. Mm-hmm. We don't play it as much like a game, right? You know, right. In that regard, yep. you know. No, absolutely. But I think for the most, I mean, it, it's a tricky situation. I think, and I don't know what's going to happen. Honestly, it's tough. But now, I, can I ask you this? Are of the shrines that we have immediate access to, are some more more challenging than others? Like, is there a better order to do the shrines in? Um. I don't think so. I don't think not that I've. I mean, I've seen some that with where their their loophole, so if I can call it that, it might be a little bit more defined. Yep. Um, maybe you guys' party composition might might be a little bit more uh, uh, better suited. Yeah, better suited for the challenge. I I did look at. I didn't look at every single shrine, but I have looked at quite a few, and and there was definitely somewhere I was like, huh, this. This shrine might actually take them five minutes, depending on which spells you guys have loaded or, right. you know, it was, you know, there was maybe two of them where I was like, huh, this, this might be, you know, this is rugged. I don't know how we're going to do, how we're going to Was gonna this do. one of the two? Yeah. You know, so far, <laughs> so far. But Are that, we going to level up soon? What did we last level up? Uh, yeah. If you guys make it through this one, this fight's definitely going to be worth a lot of XP, whether it'll be a whole level. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Ooh, if well, if we get through it, maybe we could get it spawned again, and we you could know, just grind just farm it. it. So we go <laughs> farm Shigambi until you're like level nine or so. Right. Ten. <laughs> At least seven. Come on, <laughs> get some fourth level spells. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, like I, this. Is, it feels like we're getting closer to the adventures plot like we're get we're jumping into the plot yeah absolutely point. yeah absolutely this is Which where it's entirely strange to me because up until like when we when you guys started talking about like now we're getting in it i was like what 
What have we, what been, have we doing? been doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing our own shit, making our own plots. So like, what do you, I am in it. What do you mean we're right. finally getting in it? I am in it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, now we're getting into the adventure. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. It does make things a bit easier on my end. Don't have to respond and entertain all of our emails like, oh, I want this. Can this happen for Quincy's past? <laughs> well, I'm and still yeah. getting that. This, I'm still yeah. getting that. <laughs> uh, but it's but it's easier for me to integrate. Um, right. You know, things are a little bit more detailed and written out at this point. I don't know. For whatever reason, it just seems easier for me. Like now, because there's a clear path. Yeah, it's not quite as open-ended. It's not quite as open-ended. So now it's more so I can focus on, I can actually focus more on those kind of story, those visions and the character development. Uh, I can let you, when when you guys engage in dialogues you, between your characters, I can I can sit back and just kind of let you guys go because I know that yeah. When you guys are finished, I can say, okay, at that, this happens because it says it right there, you know? Um, it's a nice breath of fresh air on my end uh, going forward from here. So far, anyway. And I'm, I'm excited. I mean, up to this point, uh, you guys haven't had a combat like this. I mean, right. You see it already. Where and I'm we're... assuming this isn't going to be the, the only one in Omu, the only challenging combat in Omu. No. No, not yeah. not at all. This is a challenging fight, and there's more to come. Uh, yeah, if, I mean, Tomb of Annihilation has a reputation. I think some character, uh, a character death is probably inevitable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's going to happen. As it's, it's, you know, I, I see you know, no like, way around it. Prepare myself for that. You know, prepare yourself to lose a character. Yeah. I think uh, like a lot of. Every time I listen to a, a podcast or people that play, they do it so gracefully. And I'm always <laughs> like, I will be kicking and screaming. Well, it's because you don't have a fleshed out alt. I yeah, but I have an awesome idea for an alt that I'm that I'm you would Kay. be excited to play and, and that would yep. be easy for me to flesh out because I've I have put a lot of thought into it. I'll um, get her on paper and we'll see what was, yeah. yeah. I bet that'll help. Yeah, like that'll all that's help. missing is the numbers, you and know. And it's also thinking about like sort of sort of uh if Irame were to die, um, sort of integrating the thought of her death as being part of her story. Right. You know? Like no. can you accept <laughs> like can you accept Irame's story as, you know, what it is and then her tragically dying at the end or heroically dying at the end? Absolutely. Like, I just think you invest in, and sometimes when you have an idea, when, when you get a plot in your mind, you know, yeah. you just, or or just emotionally invest, you know, when you when you do that and you're like, Irame needs to save her dad, you know, but then what? What has helped me when I think about, you know, Irame might not make it is, is that doesn't mean the death curse isn't going to get solved. Right. I mean, it might, it might not, who knows, but it doesn't mean that it won't. Like her God, death doesn't she's so egocentric. I know, she's right? Like the only <laughs> yeah. one that could. She's the only one that could <laughs> save the day. Um, because to Irame, she, she might, you know, upon her dying, she might feel like they, we, they we failed. failed. Yeah. yeah. But so you, it's tough. But at the same time, like you said, having an alt that you uh, have created that you'd be excited to play is is pretty key. And I mean, if, and if you don't, if you really don't want her to die, you could find those opportunities to sort of have her exit and yeah. bring in a new character. Yep. Like if she left with her mother. Yeah. For yep. example. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that would have been a point where if I if if I wasn't feeling the character anymore, or I felt I had played her out. I actually <laughs> thought that's what was happening. Yeah, I thought Aramay was leaving, and I, you were bringing yeah, we in were, a new Yeah, we were we were kind of trying to play it like something might happen. Yeah. yeah, well, you had me fooled. Right on. Well, I am. I'm excited and nervous both uh, to see where where this lands going forward. The dice ultimately, the dice are going to do the talking. And we'll just see. We'll see what uh, we'll see what happens. The first puzzle cube will be in our possession soon. Hopefully, we could get out another BTS uh, sooner. Soon, yeah. Um, yep. You know, this way we can go in a little bit more detail on things. And I, I know we do have a small group of people, anyway, at least, uh, who, who really enjoy these BTSs. And uh, once again, we apologize to you guys. Uh, thank you so much for for uh, listening and waiting patiently for one uh, but here it is and 
hopefully we'll be getting another one out uh, soon uh, after a few more episodes go by. Well, man, I don't even I don't even know what that one's going to be about because I don't know how this combat's going to end. <laughs> so uh, with that, though, uh, it's going to be about that time. It is that time. Yeah, so I, I just <laughs> want to thank everybody once again for the support. Uh, thank you for everything. Uh, thank you for, for checking out our Patreon and looking into that. We're, we're, we got it about figured out now, and uh, we will, we're working on reward tiers and, and yeah. such. Uh, I have so much going on in our lives. I know it's not a no, good excuse. Don't. I know it's not a good excuse. But um, we, well, I, even Natty Nineteen Life, we've got a lot going on. Really, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Bonus content, other adventures, appearances at Carnage Con. You know, yeah, we're actually starting to get busy with this, which is which is exciting. It's fun. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna shut up now, so we can. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all. Long days and pleasant nights. <laughs> See ya. Hopefully Zavril's okay. <laughs> <laughs>